In the previous video, we talked about the one dimensional integral and also how to take integrals of partial derivatives. What is important is to understand concepts such as the Riemann sum and substitutions from that video. This video will focus on line integrals, but first, let us mention how we can integrate vectors. Start by defining the change in position, also called displacement, as the integral of the velocity over time. Remember, when we add the vectors together, we simply do it component by component. As the integral comes from the Riemann sum, it is just many additions and should follow the same rules as addition. Therefore, we can simply write the integral over a vector as one integral for the x component and one for the y component. Let us show an example and use the velocity for circular motion. To make it even easier, set the radius to 1 and set the angular speed to pi. Now, let us start by solving the integral for this field. Insert the x component for the velocity and insert the y component. This is primitive function sinus pi t. Insert limits and note that sinus of zero is zero. This is primitive function minus cosinus pi t. Insert the limits and note that cosinus of zero is one. Let us plot this. We can animate this solution as the point move with time. SP will always be the distance from our start point to our current point. If we instead want to know our distance traveled, which is the blue curve, we should integrate the speed instead. The speed is calculated as the length of the velocity vector. Insert our x component and our y component. We can place pi outside the square root and note that cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. This is an integral of a constant. Hence, we have the two options. SP is the vector integral that gives the displacement of the point. LP will give the distance the point has traveled. In this case, the length of SP is 2, while LP has length pi. Hence, length of SP is always smaller or equal to LP. This is a direct consequence of the triangle inequality. Now, let us move on to the main topic of this video, which is line integrals. Start by rewriting the velocity as the s to t. s can be any position on the blue curve and is basically the same as sp in our example. s is given by x of t x hat plus y of t y hat. This means that vx is the x to t and vy is the y to t. Repeat the same steps for the integral for LP as well. V is the s to t. Vx and Vy are the x to t and dy dt respectively. Let us start by looking at the vector integral. We are now going to do a quite simple substitution and change the integration variable from t to s. 
This can be achieved by simply dividing dt with dt. We can do the same for the x component and y component. This also means that we can write ds as dx x up plus dy y hat. Let us call the blue curve that the point travel on c. As s is our integration variable, s moves along this curve. Hence, we will update the limit and write the integral is over the curve c. Now we have completed our substitution. Let us look at what this means. Remember how we handled the Riemann sum in previous videos. We created a sequence of points between our start point and our end point. Let's do the same here. This time, the points will be on this curve, as this is the travel path for our moving point. We can define delta Si as the difference in position between two points in this sequence. Component-wise, we simply take the difference in x component for x value and the difference in y component for y. If we would calculate the sum of all delta si, we would get the value of sp. This is an example of a curve integral as we integrate along the curve c. Let us move on to our lp integral. Do the substitution again and write it in terms of ds by dividing the t with the t. Same for the right hand side. And complete the substitution by writing that it is the integral of the curve c. This is the expression for the distance traveled or to be more general, the length of curve C. To conclude, we have converted our integral over the velocity to line integrals over the path traveled. As there are multiple paths possible, we write line integrals as the integral over a curve instead of using start and end points as we did in the one dimensional case. To make it more general, assume that we insert the function f of x and y and want to integrate this function over the curve. As a possible example, let's say that we are traveling over a varying surface and f gives the friction force as function of x and y. This integral would then be used to determine the work we need to do when we travel along the curve. We will also insert the function in the other expression. Here, we will need to write that x and y are functions of time, as the original integral used t as the integration variable. The x and y values here are coordinates on the curve. Hence, we can add the index c to mark that they are on the curve. In general, we want to have a parameterization for a curve here t is our parameterization. Hence, the common way is to solve line integrals using the parameter t as the integration variable. As we have two expressions for the line integral, we can merge them to get the final expression. The normal way is therefore that we have a line integral of f and x and y ds, which we find the parameterization for and then solve using this final expression. Let us demonstrate this by a graphical example. Create a function f of x and y and an integration path c. The line integral can now be represented by the area under this curve, similar to the one dimensional case. Note that we only care about the area under the curve. It does not matter in which direction that the curve is pointing. The final result is a scalar value. 
Let's also look at the vector version of a line integral. For scalar functions f, insert the function. This basically reduces to two separate integrals in 2D. One with, the, with respect to x, and one with respect to dy. Let us start by looking at the x direction. The geometric interpretation of this integral would be a projection onto a plane in the x direction. And the y-direction term would be a projection of the integral onto a plane in the y-direction. The integrals would then be the areas in these projections. Let us change the curve to make it visually easier to understand the difference. Draw the new integration path at the red line and the corresponding function value at the purple line. The scalar integral is the area under this curve. Again, the scalar integral does not care about the direction of the curve, only the area under the curve. Create the x-projection, which will be a quite narrow peak as we mainly move in the y-direction, where the function is, is large. This also gives that the y-projection will get a larger value than the x-projection. Let us insert the function in the vector integral. As x and y parts are solved in similar ways, let's only look at how we can solve the x part of this integral. This is actually the final expression. What we need to have is the parameterization xc and yc for x and y. Then we can insert it into this equation and solve the line integral for the x component and then repeat for the y component. In general, this one will be easier to solve than the scalar version as the square root expressions often are hard to find primitive functions for. If we have three dimensional equations, simply add the third direction in the same way. We commonly write the position R. Also, if you have a vector integrated over scalar ds, simply integrate each component separately. This one is not that common though. Let us continue and add the third direction to the vector integral as well. Rename the position vector r. Now, assume that we want to replace f with the vector v. There are three different ways of multiplying vectors. The first one is the dadic product which would give one integral for each component, hence nine integrals. If you watched the previous videos, you should know that the cross product is the off-diagonal elements of the dadic product. This one you can find, ex for example, in Biosavage law, which is common in electromagnetism to calculate magnetic fields. The final one, which shows is the most common one, is the dot product. Here I represent it by the integral for mechanical work. We basically calculate the sum of three different integrals. Let us show a visual example to illustrate this. Assume that we have a force field and the following parameterization for the curve. We are going to calculate the mechanical work when we move along this curve. Let us create a graph of the dot product f dot ds as function of t. Now animate the motion. In the beginning we are moving somewhat in the same direction as the field, hence positive value. After the midpoint we are moving somewhat opposite to the field, hence negative value. 
the final value will be the integral of the curve to the left, which is a normal one dimensional integral. For this particular case, we can see that it is anti symmetric and the result of the integral will be zero. Is there a way we could have realized this by looking at the curve to the right? Assume that we can write f as the gradient of a function. This requires irrotational flow and simply connected domain. We can visually see that this is true as there is no rotation and no holes in the domain. Now we can rewrite the integral as the integral of the gradient of phi dot ds. We can also write ds as s of ds. If we swap order of this, we see that it is the familiar directional derivative. Now we can plot the gradient of phi to the left and add the curve here as well. This means that we are integrating the slope of this curve. Let us add our sequence from the Riemann sum again. And recall the definition of the directional derivative. We can illustrate it for two points. The difference between two points is delta s. Drop the limit and turn it into an approximation. Multiply with the delta s and reorder. Now we are repeating what we did in the derivation for the one dimensional integral. Start from the Riemann sum and write out the first three terms. This term is our approximation. This as well. And these will cancel. Insert approximation again. And the middle terms cancel again. The same trend will continue and we will end up with minus phi of s0 plus phi of sn at the end. Rename s0 to the start point rs. And sn to the end point re. And we see that the integral is just the value of phi at n point minus the value at the start point. This is just like the expression for our one dimensional integral. To finish the proof, one should let the number of points go to infinity and prove that error goes to zero. But we'll skip those steps here. To answer the question if we could have figured out that the integral would be zero? Yes, by looking at the gradient, which has the same value for the start and end point. We should also note that since the integral only depends on the start point and end point, it does not matter which path we take between the two points. The path there may be different, but end result is the same. A vector field that can be written as a gradient is called a conservative field, as the work is the same no matter which path we take. And if we go around in a circle, the start point will be the same as the end point. Hence, we see that when we input the same point into the equation, the integral will be zero. 
Just remember that not all vector fields can be written as the gradient of a scale. This is all I'm going to say about line integrals here. Next up will be double and triple integrals. Thank you.